very good evening to all warm welcome to all of you for the weekly cme of ima kannur today's speaker is dr sabna pp consultant physician astamims kannur and the topic is venous thromboprophylaxis in hospitalized patients i invite dr sabna to come to the dais before going to cme association matters by the joint secretary association matters we have uh, election coming election on 25th of august 2023 the final voters list is published uh, you can check the voters list and suggest any corrections uh, Uh, anything other than that to discuss what uh, final what what is list is published election 25th 25th ne august 25th august hello sir next is introduction of the speaker by the joint secretary dr sabna pp consultant physician at astro mims kannur she did her mbbs uh, in year 2003 from uh, rajiv gandhi university bangalore she did her md general medicine from uh, pariyar medical college near 2009 uh her husband is uh, dr shabi uh, he is a surgeon at talasheri cooperative uh, they have uh, two children aisa and omar warm welcome to dr sabna to kanur ima thank respected members of kanur ima thank you for giving me this opportunity it is an honor it is an honor to share my insight on the topic thromboprophylaxis uh, the world is evolving at an unpredictable pace so the covid has given us a big example for this covid has taught us bigger lessons on the importance of following protocols and the importance of following proper treatment methodology and it has also given as a wider view of various complications associated with thromboprophylaxis various complication related to thrombus formation
So my topic is venous thromboprophylaxis, and the discussion will be mainly on patients who has been admitted in hospital. So going to the importance of venous thromboembolism, venous thromboembolism is the third most common cause of vascular mortality worldwide and comprises deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. In clinical practices, about two-thirds of VT episodes manifest as DVT and one-third as PE with or without DVT. Less frequently, thrombosis affects other veins also, including the upper extremity veins, cerebral venous sinuses, and mesenteric, renal, and hepatic veins. So the primary goal of pharmacological VTE prophylaxis is to prevent fatal PE and DVT. Prophylaxis is associated with a reduction in mortality. So as we all are well versed with visual triad and COVID has taught the importance of this picture. Coming to the VTE prevention, it mainly revolves around risk assessment and prescri prescribing appropriate prophylaxis. So as soon as the pa patient lands in the, uh, lands in the hospital, we have to uh, assess the patient for risk for the uh, VTE. And we have to uh, make a tailored prescription for the patient. So let's see what are the indications for VTE prophylaxis. VTE prophylaxis is mainly given for medical patients who are critically ill, surgical patients with major abdominal pelvic surgery for cancer, major trauma, cardiac surgery, mental health patients, general and abdominal pelvic surgery, thoracic surgery, total hip replacement, and total knee arthroplasty, and fract fragile fractures of the pelvic, hip, proximal femur, other orthopedic procedures, ambulatory patients with isolated lower limb Im immobilization, craniotomy, elective spinal surgery, vascular surgery, and bariatric surgeries. So the risk assessment tool mainly consists of Padua risk assessment score, improved risk score, Caprini score, Corana scores. So these are the common scores which we use it in the hospital to assess the adult venous thromboembolism risk. So let's go to the Padua score. Padua risk assessment score, as you all know, is mainly used in medical patients. Patients mainly admitted for medical illness. So let's see what is the classification and how much is the scoring rate. So in conditions with active cancer, history of VTE, immobilization, and laboratory proven thrombophilia, each, each carries three points, and history of recent trauma and or surgery, two points, and age more than 70, acute MI or CVA, acute infection, rheumatological disorders, BMI more than 30, and hormone therapy, this all carries one point each. So a score more than four is considered as high risk for VTE, and we have to start the patient on thromboprophylaxis. Now coming to the improved VTE risk score, this again is a scoring system which we use in medical ICUs and in medically, medically ill patients. So the scoring system uh, comes from 0 to 5, which carries the predicted risk at 35 to 42 days and 77 days. So this is the scoring system. Now coming to the Caprini score. As we all know that many of the, most often we encounter thromboembolism in a surgical patient because at the, at, at the time we miss the thromboprophylaxis. So let's see Caprini scoring system is usually uh, taken in case of decision in surgical treatment. Uh, so risk assessment tool for uh, this consists of a uh, five point marking system in which uh, the five, one point is given each for age between 41 to 60 years, two point for 61 to 74 years. And uh, as the age increases, the point system also increases and the risk is increased and other various other uh, risk factors like minor surgeries, BMI more than 25, swollen links, varicose veins, history of unexplained or recurrent abortions, pregnancy or postpartum state, oral contraceptives and hormone replacement, and other medical condition also involves the point system. So this is easily available in the internet as a calculator, as a medi calculator system, it is available. So it will be much easier for us to calculate now. So the scoring system is as follows. Zero to four carries a low risk, five to eight carries a moderate risk, more than nine carries a high risk. Now coming to the Corona score, this is mainly uh, attributed for the patients with cancer, active cancer, patients receiving chemotherapy. In such cases, we have to opt for Corona scoring system. 
so especially the score is high in case of very high risk tumors like stomach and pancreas high risk tumors uh, in from lung gynecological genital urinary uh, systems excluding the prostate carries one score and low hp less than 10 and use of red cell growth factors one pre chemotherapy leukocyte uh, count more than 11000 pre chemotherapy platelet count more than 3.5 lakhs and bmi 35 or more so the scoring system is low if it is uh, zero one to two uh, intermediate risk and more than two carries a very high risk. So coming to the another neglected field for thromboprophylaxis in antenatal and postnatal cases. The, uh, definitely there is, uh, we have seen many of the postpartum thromboembolisms in the last few years, especially post COVID, this has been increasing. So let's see what are the major risk factors for this. So the scoring system uh, considers uh, any previous VTE except single event related to major surgery, high-risk thrombophilia, hospital admission for any uh, critical illness, previous VTE related to major surgery, cesarean section in labor, BMI again carries uh, risk scores, and readmission or prolonged admission in perperium state. Any surgical procedure in the perperium uh, except immediate repair of the perineum, heart failure, active SLE, cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, inflammatory polyarthropathy, nephrotic syndrome, sickle cell disease, current IV drug users, type 1 DM and nephropathy. These are the risk factors. Again, this uh, is a um, major risk. Even uh, cases like hyperemesis is also considered as a transient risk, especially in patient who is already having additional risk factors, dehydration and hyperemesis and COVID is also considered as a uh, pregnancy related risk factor and the scoring also increases. So this is the importance of uh, giving thromboprophylaxis in uh, antenatal and postnatal. So depending on the score, we have to decide how, when to start the thromboprophylaxis and till when to give the thromboprophylaxis. If the score is more than four antenatally, consider thromboprophylaxis from first trimester. And if the score is three antenatally, consider from 28 weeks. If the score is more than two, postnatally consider for at least 10 days. If the patient is admitted to the hospital antenatally, con uh, consider again thromboprophylaxis till the uh, due date, like, uh, especially in critical illness. If uh, prolonged admission more than three days or readmission to the hospital within the weapon, consider again, we have to consider for the uh, thromboprophylaxis. Often uh, this is been missed and uh, most of the cases land up with uh, VTE and PE. So this is the RCOG uh, guidelines for uh, obstructive thromboprophylaxis and risk assessment management. Uh, this again classifies as uh, four categories, high risk, intermediate risk, and the lower risk. Again, the duration of uh, giving prophylaxis is decided upon the scoring system. This is for postnatal assessment and management for uh, pro thromboprophylaxis, again, high risk, intermediate risk has been classified according to the scoring system. Again, one of the gray areas where we neglect is the mental health patients. When patients who are uh, mental uh, admitted in the hospital for adult mental health uh, diseases are also needed to give uh, thromboprophylaxis, uh, especially uh, in these cases, we had to adopt again the medical system for a uh, risk assessment that is Padua score. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we have to go according to that. Uh, this is uh, mainly for patients who are immobile due to uh, mental health disease. So coming to what to give. So we have a pharmacological option, mechanical option and IVC filter. So coming to the pharmacological options, you have LMWH and Fondaparinex. As you all know the doses, uh, it is uh, a preferred option in patients with uh, renal impairment or patients at high risk of bleeding. And I come, uh, then again, the daltiparin, 2,500 sub-Q OD in low risk cases and 5,000 sub-Q OD in case of high risk. Again, anoxaparin, 40 uh, OD in uh, low risk and um, 30 mg BD in high risk, then Pontoparinex 2.5 mg sub QOD. Coming to UFH, uh, this is a better option with uh, for patient with renal impairment and patient at a higher risk for bleeding because uh, LMWH carries a longer duration of action. So uh, UFH is better. 
So 5,000 units sub QTID is the uh, dose for higher risk with the low, low bleeding tendencies. Coming to DOAC, DOAC usually not much preferred in case of uh, hospitalized patient. Hospitalized patient, it will be always better to start on LNWH or heparin, but if the risk is low and the, uh, the thromboprophylaxis has to be continued for a longer time, you can definitely go for a DOAC, uh, which include uh, rivaroxaban, dabigatran, and apixaban. And coming to the antiplatelets, antiplatelets are considered as the least option, option for specific orthopedic patients without any additional VTE risk factors. And in those, the other methods of uh, DVT, um, pharmacological methods are contraindicated. So in such cases where you cannot give anything, you can give low dose aspirin. And this uh, uh, is of very low importance because uh, this has to be considered as the at least option for thromboprophylaxis. Again, coming to the MOAs and uh, uses of uh, the DOAs, the dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, endoxaban, and betrixan. This has been in market since COVID, and we have been using it long. And this is a real blessing in case of uh, DVT and uh, PE, in which patient can be discharged earlier to home, and there is no need of monitoring INR so uh, such cases, uh, this has been a real blessing in situations. So coming to dabigatran, as you all know, it is an oral direct uh, thrombin inhibitor. It can be used in treatment of VT and secondary prevention also. So the doses, again, 110 day one and 220 from day two for one month. This has to be taken. It can be taken with or without food, and it should not be crushed. Again, coming to the rivaroxaban, it is a direct 10 day inhibitor you can again use it. So the dose is usually once daily, uh, 10 milligram for the first, uh, and for, uh, for 12 days, it has to be continued in case of TKR and 35 days for THR. Uh, it can be used with food and it can be crushed. And apixaban, apixaban has also been widely used, especially in orthopedic surgeries. And it has been widely uh, used post TKR and THR. It has been given for 12 days to 35 days. And one uh, odd thing about uh, apixaban is it has to be usually given without food. It, like it should be given with food. That is the better option, which is always considered in case of apixaban. And endoxaban, again, uh, we can use for VTE treatment and secondary prophylaxis. And betrixacam is also an, an option. Coming to switching over the therapies. How to switch over from warfarin, a patient who is already in warfarin and uh, he want to, like he has a problem in monitoring INR. In such cases, you can go to a DOAs where you don't need uh, monitoring of uh, INR. So dabigatran can be started when the patient on warfarin reaches an INR of two or less than two. Then apixaban also two. In betrixaban, it has to be around 2.5. In endoxaban, it is 2.5 again. Rivaroxaban, the INR has to be there to 3. Then only you can switch over from warfarin to DOAs. Now, the other option. Some patients might be there who are not affordable and they may need, they might be already started from on DOAs and they may need to be start, uh, shifted to warfarin. And in cases of uh, severe renal failure also, warfarin would be a better option. In such cases, you have to stop DOS, then start LMWH, and then again the normal bridging has to be done. Or patient who does not want hospitalization in such cases overlap warfarin with DOS. So as I mentioned earlier, again from in uh, apixaban, you have to stop DOS, then start LMWH and warfarin at the time of next DOS dose and bridge until the INR is more than two. Again, rivaroxaban stop DOS, then start LMWH and warfarin at the time of next DOS dose and bridge it when the INR is more than 2. And endoxaban for 60 mg reduce, uh, 60 mg dose, reduce dose to 30 mg and start warfarin concomitantly. Then uh, for 30 mg dose reduce to 15 mg and start warfarin along the side. And stop endoxaban when INR is more than 2. Coming to dabigatran, again, start warfarin and overlap with dabigatran. This is for creatine clearance rate. We have to overlap uh, for three days, two days, and one days respectively, according to the creatine clearance. 
now coming to the contraindication to pharmacological vt we all know uh, this is absolute contraindication include patient who is already anticoagulant and already on heparin uh, or patient who is already on warfarin and active major bleeding requiring blood transfusion recent clinical uh, bleeding again uh, which has been life threatening for the past 48 hours uh, thrombocytopenia is not an absolute contraindication unless the platelet is less than 50000 so uh, here you have to outweigh the risk of bleeding with the risk of thromboprophylaxis and again in patients with inherited or acquired bleeding disorders relative contraindication includes surgical procedures with high risk bleeding like head and neck surgeries neurosurgeries in recent gi bleed recent uh, cns bleedings and intracranial or spinal lesion deemed by neurosurgeon to be at high risk of bleeding and again in uncontrolled systemic hypertension cases associated with uh, active peptic ulcer bleeding severe hepatic disease or acute liver failure and other condition with significant bleeding needs now coming to the mechanical prophylaxis mechanical prophylaxis has to be used alongside your thrombo um, pharmacological thrombo prophylaxis uh, but in some cases uh, where patient are contraindicated for uh, pharmacological prophylaxis you can just use mechanical prophylaxis mechanical prophylaxis it has to be used until the mobility has been returned to anticipated or clinically acceptable level or when the patient is discharged from hospital so the common mechanical devices which we use in india it is intermittent pneumatic compression or sequential compression device including food impulse devices or graduated compression stockings so ipc and gcs ipc is most commonly used in our settings coming to ipc include uh, this include a sleeve cuff applied to the legs and garments wrapped around the foot and uh, ipc is more effective than gcs in preventing dvt in surgical patients ipc is recommended over gcs in patient with moderate to high vt risk and patient who are not receiving pharmacological prophylaxis like patients who are having severe thrombocytopenia or bleeding upper gi bleeds in such cases you have to make sure that patient is at least on a mechanical thromboprophylaxis and again ipc recommend uh, uh, is recommended in patient at very high uh, risk of vt that are on combined mechanical and pharmacological prophylaxis and again gcs uh, it applies pressure on the leg muscles to squeeze the vein valves uh, so it gives a greater degree of compression at the ankles and decreases the level of compression at the leg this helps to increase the blood flow upwards to the heart and instead of it is reflecting uh, downwards uh, unlike the ipcs so again you have to consider uh, some factors for uh, initiation of mechanical prof prophylaxis uh, ipcs or sequential either can be selected according to the patient and these are the some of the things which you have to make sure before starting on mechanical prophylaxis like uh, you have to measure the patient's uh, uh, correct cuff size has to be maintained and you have to instruct uh, give proper instruction to be given to the staff and again the graduated compression stockings the measurements and other manufacturer recommendation should be checked and you should encourage the patient to wear stockings continuously day and night until mobility is no longer significantly reduced or unless otherwise specified by the treating medical team advise patient not to roll or fold the stockings for mobilizing because there is a risk of fall then let's see what are the contraindication for mechanical vt like severe peripheral artery disease or ulcers in the leg recent skin grafting peripheral artery bypass graft leg edema or pulmonary edema for congestive heart failure because the blood again rushes to the heart and it can worsen pulmonary edema the known allergy to materials of the and uh, of the particular device and severe local problems on the legs like gangrene dermatitis untreated infectious wound fragile tissue paper skin so again before starting mechanical prophylaxis you have to do a vascular assessment uh, test which includes palpation of the peripheral pulses skin blanch test before uh, starting on the uh, devices and there are some patients for him ipc is suitable than gcs this is a patient admitted with stroke and severe leg deformity and severe peripheral neuropathy now coming to the ivc filters ivc filters is a 
filter which we are fitting into the IVCs, this in reduces the risk of PE. But there is no strong evidence to support the prophylactic use of IVC. This has to be considered only in patients who are contraindicated for both the mechanical as well as the um, pharmacological prophylaxis and patients who are at very high risk of VTE. There is no uh, strong evidence for the use of IVC filters. This is the usual IVC filter we use. Now coming to a little bit of uh, clinical scenarios. Uh, we'll just assess the tool system which we have been introduced right now. So 45-year-old female patient has been admitted with UTI. Uh, she is a known case of rheumatoid arthritis. She is on methotrexate. So in this patient, we have to use Padua score. So uh, since she is having rheumatoid arthritis, the score system is low. So it is a low risk. So she need not need a uh, thromboprophylaxis. And considering the second case, it is a patient who has been admitted for total hip replacement. So here we have to use the Caprini score. Uh, here the patient's age is 70 and 70 years. So scoring increases and the procedure is THR. So th that again carries five score. So 5 plus 2, Caprini score comes to around 7. So she definitely need a thromboprophylaxis. Now coming to the reversal. So when we are giving the anticoagulation, you should always make sure that the reversible agents reversible agents are available. So as you all know, heparin, protamin sulfate, UFH also protamin can be used, dabigatrin. And dabigatrin, indrazumab can be used, and apixabam, and dexanat alpha, and divaroxaban again, and dexanat alpha can be used. So coming to the reversal, warfarin, as you all know, if it is above, if it is less than lead, and uh, you have to omit the doses, and we should make sure that vitamin K should be given only in serious or life-threatening bleedings. So what to take back with us? We should always make sure the rhombo prophylaxis is always given in patient who needs it and it should it, it is a thing which has always been missed so in such cases you have to take back the the scoring system which is nowadays very much available in all the med calculators and prophylaxis is associated with reduction in mortality risk of bleeding need to be assessed in each patient getting admitted i have to choose wisely depending upon the safety and cost for the patient and tailor treatment to be done for each patient. Always make sure that reversing agents are available. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabna, for the excellent and very informative talk on thromboembolism. The topic is open for discussion.
usually in such cases you have to decide uh, with the you have to make the team with the surgeon and if it was a ma not a massive bleeding definitely it has to be started after 24 hours because even in patients who had been who has come with a major bleeding manifestations we have had cases who have gone for thromboembolisms so it should not be postponed if, if if the surgeon is confident there there is no bleeding vessels Yeah, because uh, this from the point of surgeons, uh, they think that even if the patient comes with a VTE, it is okay. Uh, because if it comes with bleeding, they consider that it is surgeon's fault. So that is the reason why most of the surgeons are reluctant to start on uh, thromboprophylaxis. As sir has addressed the issue, uh, but it ha according to the protocols and according to the guidelines, it has to be started. If the surgeon is confident, there is no bleeding vessels. Yeah, yeah. Immobilize early, early, early mobilization. Uh, but uh, according to even in Indian studies, most of the studies have come up post COVID, and uh, most of the studies are lacking. Uh, whether it has been misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed, that is again a, a topic of discussion. Uh, but none of majority of the patient which we start on thromboprophylaxis. Uh, has not ended up with any bleeding manifestations, especially in orthopedic surgeries. We give for around uh, one month. Uh, thromboprophylaxis is given with apixaban. Rivaroxaban is commonly used in our hospitals. So, so far, no bleeding manifestation. The newer ones are very good, and uh, we have not encountered any bleeding manifestation with rivaroxaban and apixaban. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, ideal time to start surgical prophylaxis again is within 24 hours after uh, 24 hours after surgery. If the patient is, yeah, after surgery. Yeah. No, uh, in such cases, consumer cases will not be applied because this is based on uh, guidelines and protocols. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, now, now most of the hospitals are adopting the same. Even in India, most of the major hospitals, they have a hospital protocol to start on uh, DVT prophylaxis and there are committees to analyze the thromboprophylaxis. Yeah. 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 Bleeding. Bleeding is common. Hi, Bye. Bye. But you, usually, if you take the data, patient dying due to low molecular heparin or heparin is very less compared to patient dying of PTE and VTE. So that is the main role for... Uh... So you are doing something that is kind of good. Uh, 
No, even in thermoprevalence access in mechanical valves, it has to be start stop max before four hours. That's why we uh, uh, switch over to heparin. And as soon as the surgery, once the bleeding risk, it has to be started because the cases of thromboembolism is very high. Uh, many cases have, uh, you know, uh, we don't know the cause for death. The patient died post-surgery. So such cases are mostly attributed to, post-mortem findings are attributed to embolic embolism. The only thing is we, uh, in, we don't have a larger Indian studies to monitor this. No, most of the cases diagnosis missed. No, no, uh, no. Since we have international accepted protocols, there is no need of getting consent. No, there is no concern. As far there is no legal uh, problem in starting uh, thermoprofile. No, before. No, there is le legally there is no uh, need for consent because this is a drug. Uh, if it is like that, we may need to start for warfarin, everything, heparin, everything we may need to. Even uh, when you're giving paracetamol, we may need to give consent, take consent because it can cause nip. Yeah. In, in that, it will be included bleeding and clotting risk. It is included. So that so so uh, so that is why we have the caprini system of scoring to assess the risk. Only in higher risk patient we need to start, not for all the patients.
so uh, same thing apply to the second thing if the patient land up in a pulmonary embolism the patient can sue us even telling that even if the options were available such scoring system were available if it is not used again the patient can also sue us so any drug will have a effect and a side effect not all the drugs have a antidote so no in so no it no in case of pp obstructive surgery it is different it has to be started only after 24 hours once there is no that is the risk scoring system okay and uh, was well accepted by the audience also as it kindled a very heated debate thank you and i on behalf of ima kannur i thank each and every one of the members for attending this meeting thank you